Mark Cooler is nominated for his third Oscar for his prosthetic makeup, this time for Pinocchio. I'm Riley Chow. Now, were you surprised by how little we saw of Pinocchio's nose in this adaptation? Um, yeah, well, I guess uh, I was talking about this the other day about, you know, everybody remembers the fact that Pinocchio, you know, when he lies, his nose grows. But in actual fact, it's only for a, a, a small part of the um, uh, of the of the story that 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 actually comes into uh, into play. So, yeah, you don't actually see the nose growing constantly in, in the movie. And you never have done in any of the adaptions, really. Yeah, and I bring up the nose because that's one of the areas where I wonder, like, what is your role in creating that thing? Uh, where does costumes and where does visual effects start? Uh, so what was your role in that one? Well, we're, uh, in which particular? In the sequence when uh, the nose actually grows, when you see yeah. it growing. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a, a, a visual effects um, uh, thing done by a company called The One of Us, uh, Theo Demiris, who was in, the, in charge of uh, the, the visual effects on this film. So um, for that one, they had a, a helmet built that, that, the, um, that Federico uh, uh, wore on his head with a, uh, with a rod sticking out of the front. So they, had, they could track where the nose position was at any given point. And then it was created digitally uh, for that particular sequence. It was one of a few sequences that uh, visual effects were used uh, with, with Pinocchio. Um, another example was when his uh, feet get burnt off, when he leaves his uh, wooden legs in the fire and his feet get burnt off. Again, uh, we filmed that with makeup on, uh, with little green socks on his uh, lower legs and uh, uh, visual effects uh, replaced uh, the, the, the feet. Another one uh, that caught my attention was the tuna. Like that one, I thought for sure was, you know, you had nothing to do with. But then I was going through your Instagram, uh, which, you know, everybody should follow uh, because of all the amazing Thank work you. that you showcase there. I've never said that in an interview, but uh, that tuna is there. Uh, so what was your work in creating that? Yeah, so that was really interesting because um, all the way through, we were building all the characters, you know, the Puppet Theatre and Pinocchio and the cat and the fox. And then Matteo Garoni, the director, just kept saying, oh, you know, we've got a tuna fish makeup to do as well. And uh, I was thinking, OK, that's going to be a, a visual effects thing, you know, and it's a kind of, you know, I, I'd talk to visual effects and say, hey, are you guys doing the tuna fish? And they would be like, no, 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 I believe that's uh, a makeup. So it was like we, we were just think how do you do a tuna fish makeup you know how do you get somebody's face in a in a tuna fish but the only thing we you know we once the actor was cast uh we, we then uh, took a head cast of him and the only thing you can do really is just throw some clay on it and see what happens you know and see if you can actually create something that looks fish like because Matteo because he's so character oriented you know he's really interested in seeing the human quality of all these animalistic characters and he really wanted this nice interplay with Pinocchio uh, to be with the tuna fish talking to him uh, with the performance and Pinocchio gives him a little kiss on the on on the on the head and Matteo just really wanted a makeup in there so we did a test and we we found that we could do a face makeup and then visual effects would then track on the tail at the, at the back ends our makeup of fishes, um, it's about sort of four or five inches back from the head. So it was quite a huge uh, prosthetic makeup with a foam up structure. And then uh, we had some tracking markers around the edge. And then uh, the, uh, the one of us uh, visual effects added the, the tail and made it interact with the water. And, and uh, you know, it, it worked really well in the film, I think. You know, it's just, it was nice for Matteo to keep all these characters have have a very similar theme in the fact that you can really see the the human person in there. Uh, Pinocchio he wears this uh, pointy hat, and I wondered if there was a practical reason for that behind the scenes, like maybe that was covering up some of the makeup or something. But then he actually takes it off several times in the film to use it uh, as a bucket. Uh, so was there any reason for the hat uh, beyond you know he wears a hat in the story? No, it was just uh, the costume that um, 
uh, uh, Massimo uh, Cipollino have made for it. Um, and it's based on some of the early drawings of Mazzanti and uh, Chiostri, where Pinocchio does have this little pointed hat. So it comes from the original illustrations, really. When, when Pinocchio is wearing a hat in those illustrations, it's generally a little, point, a little, little pointy hat as it is in, in, uh, in, our, in our film. Uh, another point that there are pointy hats is uh, when Pinocchio gets uh, hung from a tree. Uh, and that scene had me wondering uh, who the intended audience uh, for this film is. Uh, do you have uh, a take on that? Well, I think, you know, it's a, it's a children's fairy tale, uh, you know, uh, uh, at, the, at, the, at the underneath, at the bottom, bottom line. And, you know, Matteo, like myself, are, uh, you know, really interested in the generally the fairy tales uh, that have a bit of a dark element to them. You know, these these stories are uh, morality tales, you know, when you're, uh, you know, teach your kids not to go walking in the forest in the dark, you know, because, you know, the wolf lurks there and Red Riding is taking the, you know, new, newly baked uh, cakes to her grandma and Pinocchio wanders off with the strangers and gets kidnapped and taken to the uh, puppet theater or the land of toys, you know, th these are all morality tales. And, you know, there is a dark element in them in all fairy tales of, the, of this nature. So um, although it's a child's fairy tale, you know, and it's, ba it's basically written for children and children are quite entranced by it, it's still got that sort of slightly more adult, darker edge to it, which I think is purposeful, you know, that Matteo wanted to keep that element of, of fairy tale uh, alive in there. So you have won two Oscars, two BAFTAs, two Emmys. Uh, and looking through your filmography, I don't really see uh, much of a through line. Uh, this past year, in addition to Pinocchio, you also had Borat, you had Wonder Woman. Uh, at this point, since you have your company, are all these uh, films just coming to you? Yeah, generally speaking, it's, uh, you know, I've been doing this for a long time now, sort of 30 years. So I build up contacts and I work for the same people quite often. Um, my modus operandi really is to do, um, you know, varied selection of work, you know, uh, hopefully with a script that's engaging or, you know, uh, some characters that we have to make that are really interesting to me. So, you know, Wonder Woman, for example, we'd never done a, 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 a sort of cheetah cat-like makeup before. Um, and Pinocchio, similarly, uh, lots of fantastic characters, you know, these wonderful illustrations that uh, Pietro di Scolomambro had done for Matteo. And uh, when we first started the project, it was like, oh, wow, you know, we'd never done characters like this before. It's not very often you see such um, imaginative makeup characters uh, uh, to do for a film, you know, they come along uh, once in a while. Um, you know, after The Iron Lady, we got a lot of old age makeups to do, you know, be, because they go, oh, you know, who does the old age makeups? Oh, that guy who did uh, The Iron Lady. So we ended up doing quite a lot of movies that had age aging characters in there and you get known for that, but I like to sort of step away from what I'm known for and do something that's, uh, you know, unusual to me, whether it's creating a character or doing the horror movie Suspiria or, um, you know, doing Bohemian Rhapsody, you know, and, uh, you know, doing lookalikey makeup. So we've just worked on Baz Luhrmann's Elvis movie, um, creating uh, some characters for that, you know, some makeups for that. So, it, yeah, I like, I like to mix it up a bit and keep it varied. What films do you think prepared you for Pinocchio? Oh, every single film I've ever worked on <laughs> because this film has like, 30, I think we did 33 different makeups altogether. Um, each one of those makeups was really technically challenging, whether it's the tuna fish or whether it's the full snail suit with full foam latex suit with silicon makeup and hands uh, or the fox, there's hair laying and hair punching and uh, the birds, there's really complicated feather work to make them look, uh, uh, you know, like, like half human half bird it's not just covering everything with feathers it's moving from hair to feathers very slowly across the face so we start with hairs in the center and move to feathers by the time you get to the back of the head um so each one was really technically complex and i've worked with a lot of 
different characters on for example that movies we did a lot of feather work on that and we did a lot of uh, creature building uh, suit building and all every you know you learn something from every um, job that you do you know you learn that foam latex shrinks by 10 percent. so if you want to make a foam latex suit you've got to accommodate for the shrinkage of the foam latex so uh, you know learn that feathers you can't just buy the the right feathers the right size and the right color so you have to cut them and shape them and dye them you know all, all these things every little nugget of information was used on this film i think a week ago you won the makeup and hairstylist guild award for pinocchio uh, can you tell me about winning that trophy oh yeah that was a real honor i think because you know, it's it's um, a, an event that's specifically for makeup and hairstylists, you know, so it recognizes our entire makeup and hairstyling category through daytime TV shows to special effects, to period makeup. So everybody gets a chance in that one, you know, so and it is it's very prestigious and I'm really honored to be able to, uh, you know, get nominated for that. And then finally to win it was was just uh the icing on the cake, really. Yeah, it was it was a real honor. Uh, you mentioned the Iron Lady. Uh, that's the first Oscar that you got. I'm wondering if you have any observations about uh, what they're doing differently in The Crown, uh, adapting Margaret Thatcher in that series versus what you did in The Iron Lady. Do you know what? I haven't seen The Crown at all. You know, I've not seen. It's kind of on my list to watch, but I've I haven't I haven't done it yet. Um, so all I've seen is a little snippet of about. 10 seconds of, of uh, Margaret Thatcher. Um, and I think, you know, it's just a different vehicle. I mean, you know, Phyllida Lloyd in The Iron Lady was making a movie about uh, the transition from power to um, dementia, you know, from power to having a lack of power. And, and it was more of a, a study of old age and how, how you, what, what happens to you when all that previous glory goes away and you're just you know, an anonymous old person, you know, and you have to choose somebody famous to do that to because that's that's what happens to someone who's really famous. They become uh, anonymous at some point in their life. Um, or, you know, with the trappings of old age, just catch up on with everybody. So I think The Crown is much more of a, uh, you know, a, a historical storytelling of, of you know, uh, events rather than a, a study of people and old age. Now, when you're voting for these Best Makeup Awards, uh, are you gravitating toward the heavier prosthetic work that usually wins, or do you go for subtle work, or uh, how do you fill out your palette? Oh, for me personally, when I'm looking at a movie, I just like to be wrapped up in the characters, and it doesn't matter whether it's a really complex, full-on prosthetic makeup bodysuit, or whether it's just a moustache on somebody. For me, it's more about the success of the character being something that you don't even notice. I mean, I think, you know, the straight mega, the prosthetics aside in Pinocchio, I think, you know, when I watched the film, because we worked quite in different rooms when we were doing the makeups, because we were so busy in the prosthetics department getting our characters ready that when Dahlia and Francesco were doing uh, Geppetto, for example, I didn't know what he had on, you know, I didn't know whether he had a wig on or a bald cap or, and when I watched the movie, I still, until I listened to, Dali and Francesco talking about the, all their characters and all the work that they did. I even I didn't know that you know Geppetto had a bald pate on and, mm. and the wig over the top, so you could see through. And so I think that's really successful. And I think you know any film or, that I can watch where you know there's a prosthetic makeup or a straight makeup or a period wig in there, and I don't question it. I don't look at it and think, oh, that's a wig. You know, then I think that's uh, really successful. Or you know, when the makeup design is really interesting or, you know, I watched The Favourite again um, a few weeks back and I just think it's really wonderful for makeup and hair because it's really authentic, you know, and it's it's like they would have applied the makeup at the time. And so many, so many period movies get it wrong, you know, um, and, you know, you can watch, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, a, a Viking drama and the guys look clean or they look like they've just come out of the hairdressers, you know, whereas I want to see the grit and the dirt that would be on there in the real situation, you know? So it's about authenticity really and about being carried away by the story. 
Right. Uh, well, Mark, uh, thanks very much for chatting with Cold Derby. Ah, thank you.